Good morning, fans of Sports for All, and good evening to Coach Faf over in Texas. Welcome to the program, Coach. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. All right, uh, let's get right to it. My my first question is, Coach, um, if uh, if you saw the athletics events, the track and field events at the recently concluded Tokyo Olympics, we saw a lot of records were broken and, and a, a scientist or a, a coach, a scientist over at the University of Michigan said that, uh, said something about um, uh, technical doping because of the, the shoes that the, most of the athletes were wearing and the track was fast and the Nike shoes, the latest Nike track shoes that they were wearing gave the feet a lot of bounce when it hits the track surface. So people are saying it's technical doping because of the shoes that they were wearing. So what are your thoughts about the, the records that were broken, the, the fast surface of the track over in Tokyo? Well, there's always a lot of variables that come together for a, a record performance or an elevation of performance. But I think what you had in Tokyo is looking at the statistics and comparing them over time and comparing the athlete statistics to pre previous years and whatnot. There was probably what I would call some technical assistance coming from the surface itself, uh, the Mondo engineers, said in their testing and data, the return speeds and forces were, were probably two to 3% higher than the previous Mondo tracks. And then depending on the shoe company, it's not just Nike, all the shoe companies had super shoes, primarily using carbon plates or carbon rods. And some of the companies had, you know, midsoles that had super cells in them, which Nike was a pioneer in. And our research shows, depending on the event, and this goes from marathon all the way down to 100 meters, or even in the jumping events, uh, these shoes ranged anywhere from 0.8% mean average performance elevation to as high as 4% in some cases. So if you take Low, lower numbers, two to three percent out of the track, and in two to three percent out of the shoes, six percent in some of these events is a huge assist. Okay, and what is 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 that technical doping? Technically, is it well? Tec technically, is it technical doping? Um, is should there be any limitations or? Or, or standards set by the I, IAAF on the types of shoes that track and field athletes should use? Well, there's a long history and precedent to guidelines and restrictions and metrics on shoes and shoe design and even track surfaces. You know, the IAAF for World Athletics requires certain parameters on a track testing and to be certified at a level one or level two class, there, there are certain metrics that they have to meet. It's obvious that these shoes and these tracks far exceeded metric boundaries. So it, it's a bit of a misnomer to call it doping. Let's just say a, a huge technical te technology boost to performance coming from not only the shoes, but the track surface itself. And there is a long precedent for track and field federations to have control over both those variables. And they've decided to raise the ceiling on those. Okay, and you would you recommend your coaches, your athletes to wear these shoes and uh, you know, to win their races, to win, to win their heats? Well, it's not as simple as that they're magic shoes. So what we're seeing is certain shoes work for certain body types and certain engineering models work better for other events and whatnot. So it's not like you could just put on a shoe and magically you're going to be 5% better. So you had to figure out, you know, if you weren't sponsored by a shoe company, you had to figure out what shoes work best for you or what design some of the leading athletes had input to, to the designs they 
beta tested certain designs and eventually settled on a certain model or, or concept. So there's a lot of layers to this, you know, like in our experience with a lot of our athletes, it took some of them eight to 10 sessions before they knew how to control what the shoe was doing to their feet and, and to their body. And in some instances, the uh, athletes got pretty serious injuries off these new shoes because the body couldn't cope with what uh, the shoe was doing to it. So it wasn't like it was just magic. Everybody put on the shoe and everybody was better. You know, some people got injured. Some people struggled to learn how to control it. Uh, but at the end of the day, carbon in a shoe is going to accelerate forces and movement. Yeah, and carbon's rigid, so it's going to send forces up through the body quicker and more powerfully. If the body can handle that, then life is good. But a lot of times the structures in the feet and the lower leg or the knee can't handle those forces. So it's kind of like when we went from wood rackets to fiberglass to carbon composition rackets, uh, you know, shoulder and elbow injuries and surgeries went through the roof on the tennis tour because the carbon racket increased these forces and velocities. Okay, coach, I wanna to go to, to Donovan Bailey. Uh, how long did you guide him? How long did you coach him? Uh, he came to us in, in the fall of 1994 and I coached him through 1997 world champs. And then uh, we, we had a disagreement on life 101 and so he moved away. And then when he ruptured his Achilles tendon uh, 18 months later, then he came back and we rehabbed and tried to put him together the best we could. So I coached him the rest of his career through 2001. Edmonton, I think, was kind of his last hurrah. What were your thoughts on his rivalry with Michael Johnson? There, there was a race between him and Michael Johnson. What what did you advise him? What, what were your words of wisdom to him throughout this rivalry? Well, you know, I really wouldn't call it a rivalry. They, they never raced against one another in an organized track meet that I'm aware of. This was a put together made for TV race. Uh, it was a compromise. Donovan was a hundred meter specialist. Michael was a two, four. So their agents agreed on a hybrid distance being 150. Uh, I wasn't in favor of it. Um, Donovan has a lot of hip injuries and hip problems throughout his career and running on a curve is kind of risky for him. And he was going to have to run on a curve. But once the contract was signed, uh, we had to come up with plans and logistics and strategies to cope with that. Um, I think a lot of people thought that because Donovan was a 100-meter specialist, 150 would be out of his zone, that he would fatigue and Michael's endurance would take over. But I think people fail to, to look at what happens in a relay where a relay runner gets quite a, a distance of run in before they hit that 100-meter mark, and they get the baton, and they run through the tape. So it's quite common for a relay anchor person to run 130 or 140 meters really fast. So it wasn't like Donovan's not used to running that kind of distance fast. And, you know, my, my opinion, once we had to make the decision to run the race was that Donovan would win just be, because of his power out, output and his absolute speed values. It, his speed wasn't going to decay that much over a 150. And this, uh, was this a fastest, fastest man alive? Is this something that was conceptualized and born by the media, or what are your thoughts on? I mean, is the one hundred does does the one hundred or the two hundred meters prove who's the fastest on the planet? Which which is which? Well, to me, the fastest means who hits the top speed. And it's obvious 100 meter sprinters hit a higher speed than 200 meter runners. So to me, it's not even a question, but that's my opinion. To me, as a physicist, the fastest speed is the top speed obtained by the athlete. And, you know, world-class 
sprinters are, you know, 12, eight, 12, nine meters per second, you know, 200 meters runners don't hit those speeds. So how can you call 200 meter specialists the fastest men in the world? Classically, media has given that title to the 100 meter champion. You've, you've coached both in the US and the UK. What is the distinction or the difference between American athletics and English athletics? Oh, well, I think in America, there, there's an advantage that sport is very organized and sponsored and coaches are paid uh, through most of these athletes' careers until they graduate university. So middle school and high school coaches uh, are paid. Uh, the facilities are excellent. There's lots of competition. There's a huge talent pool. Uh, you know, these kids are racing week in and week out against top competition. And this goes on until they're 22, 23 years old when they exit university. And that's where the U.S. system falls down. Once they're out of university, they're kind of on the street. So unless they get a shoe contract or find a sponsor or can combine work and postgraduate studies with training, that's where it falls off. Where in the UK system, they have a government system that if you're an elite athlete, the government sends funding into you. And so they kind of support a little bit better at the top end, but where they fall down is in their school systems. They don't have paid coaches and it's really a club sport environment where kids train two or three nights a week with the club. And the competition level is not as stringent as in the US. Uh, so these, a lot of times these athletes don't face really intense competition until they go to a, a European level championship. So they don't get the number of extreme competition challenges throughout their sport life. You've been around the sport for 40 years, coach. Has, has your coaching philo philosophy and coaching style, has it evolved throughout the 40 years? Or are you sticking with what, or have you been sticking to what, what's been working for you? Well, it's almost 50 uh, years now. Um, I would say I, I was pretty fortunate at young age to uh, work under Tom Telez, Carl Lewis's coach. And he's been a lifelong mentor. And so I was fortunate to see training systems and biomechanics and modeling and teaching and pedagogy at a really high level. And so I was a high school coach. I coached a lot of sports and I was a science teacher and I was always looking at sports scientifically. So I think I was blessed that way. I grew up on a farm. So I, I wore a lot of hats on the farm. You know, we had agriculture and we had livestock and my dad owned a construction company. So I was a universalist there. I had to know plumbing and electricity and concrete and framing and roofing and what have you. So I was pretty blessed that I was raised to be a generalist and a universalist and to have a mentor like Coach Delez. So I'd say a lot of my first principles and heuristics and big rocks haven't changed that much. Now, tweaks and whatnot, add-ons, bolt-ons, clean things up, play with the numbers a little bit. Yeah, you evolve. And, you know, that depends on what event you're coaching, the health of the athlete, the time of year, stage of career, what's coming up. But I would say the essentials, the fundamentals and the first principles, I, I was pretty blessed to have them at an early age as a young coach and uh, been able to network and get confirmation that, hey, those big rocks are truly the big rocks. I think a lot of coaches now with social media and whatnot, you know, they're just grabbing stuff out of free air and throwing it against the wall and hoping it sticks. They really don't understand how to put the, uh, quote, machine together. And uh, I want to ask you, Coach, you know, let's, let's go to marathon a bit. And I want to ask you, why do you know, the, the marathoners from the East African countries do so well running barefoot? Why, why are they, how are they able to do that? And you know, um, can you explain how, how can they run so well barefoot? Well, I think culturally, they, they grow up in, in pretty 
uh, deprived areas economically. <laughs> and then just culturally, then, you know, the culture has been, you know, bare feet. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of misnomer. I think most Kenyans and Tanzanians and Ethiopians and whatnot wear shoes to school. And if they walk to school, they wear shoes. So I think there's a little, little bit of a myth out there. That these kids are barefoot all day long and they do their running. You know, I've, I've worked with athletes that spent extended time in the Rift Valley and all of that. And, you know, all the workouts were done in shoes. So I think that's a little bit of a myth. But I think the youngsters, you know, primary school kids, they probably do a lot of running and walking around in sport, like, you know, football or whatnot, barefoot, just because they don't have the resources to buy shoes for those activities. You, okay, like I said, almost 50 years, you've been around the, the sport. Obviously, you're a teacher of the game. Are you, are you also... Are you also a student of the sport? Even after 50 years, are you still learning? Oh yeah, I never stop learning. I mean, that's, that's kind of my, my passion is, is developing networks and layers and networks of expertise. And when I get a puzzle or a question, you know, I'll go to top people and say, what should I read? What articles, what research, where are you sitting on this? And I'll play devil's advocate of between various experts trying to clean down the essence or the essential of, of, of concept, but never stop learning. I don't know, my room's a little dark. This is my library. I got miles and miles of files and books, and I got six one terabyte hard drives on my desk here with video that I review and measure things and research articles. And um, like I said, I started out as a classroom teacher, a science teacher, and um, you know, in my day, we didn't have internet. You had to go to the library and check books out or read journals there and make notes. And this even predates photocopy machines. So if I saw a photo sequence in a journal, I had to trace it with onion skin paper because of either that or I could steal the journal, but I, I had a little bit of ethics, so I didn't steal the journal. Is there, is there any track and field athlete or... 100 meter or 200 sprinter you would have interested to coach, whether from the past or right now, anyone you would be, you would, would interest you to coach? I don't know. I, I never really think that way. I never look over, over the fence. I'm always worried about the animals on my farm. So I've never really said, oh man, I'd love to have that guy or that girl. You know, I appreciate uh, excellence and um, you know, seeing an athlete, everybody's an armchair quarterback, right? You see a person run or compete and you go, oh, you know, if they just do this, 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 they'd run faster. Well, you know, I've done that. I've had athletes come to me late in their career and, and we've agreed, let's tweak this or that. And they ran slower. So, you know, th there's no magic formula on this. Well, at least how about those at least who have been under your tutelage who, who's the best you've coached? Well, in your opinion, I mean. Well, again, like I get asked this all the time. I travel all over the world. Hey, what's your favorite city or your favorite food or whatever? Well, I, I enjoy all of it. And each place has its special nuances and whatnot. And it's the same thing with athletes. Like I've coached six or seven guys under 10 seconds. Every one of those guys was different. They had different strengths and weaknesses and tendencies and what have you, but that's what made them special. So it's really about playing the chess game more so than whatever, you know, you can win. The best I could do is say, hey, if we do things right, we'll get to the final. Now getting on the podium, we got to have a lot of things go right. And to win it, we got to have a lot of things go right. So I, I never had the equation to say, hey, you're going to win the Olympics. I, I never had that ability. I had the ability to say, hey, if, if you're healthy and you run your race right, we'll probably in the finals. And then once we got in the finals, like, okay, based on current form, 
if you run real correct, you're probably going to be on the podium, but can I predict you're going to be gold, silver, or bronze? Uh, I was never that good. <laughs> Coach, what are your thoughts on um, uh, that, that lady um, sprinter, Jakari? You know, what are your thoughts on marijuana? And all? I want to get your thoughts on, on her situation. Well, it's, I mean, it's disheartening to see this is obviously a very special talent and uh, she knew the rules and she violated the rules for whatever reason. And, you know, when you violate rules, they have consequences. So I, I thought it was not great for the sport. It's definitely not good for our country. Um, you know, the media took it, made a firestorm out of it. Um, you know, do I think marijuana is a performance enhancing drug? Not super directly, but it can calm you down. So if you're super nervous or your, your sympathetic system is in overdrive and it can calm that down, that is a performance enhancement. You know, how much of an enhancement? I don't know. I think culturally, you know, like most of the pro leagues in America have given up on policing marijuana. So, you know, I, I don't know where World Athletics will go on this or the IOC, but um, I think they're kind of fighting a losing battle on that front. They're just, it's such a cultural uh, factor in Western countries that um, this won't be the last if they keep that rule, you know, in place. So it, it was a sad occurrence for me, you know, as I would have liked to seen her in the Olympics running really well to see how that would have played out, but she made a decision that eliminated that opportunity. Coach, the we've seen we've seen the rise of Jamaican track and field with Usain Bolt, and that seems to have continued with with their four by one hundred women's track and field team. What what do you think of 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 Jamaican track and field, and you think they'll continue to be a threat? To both Canadian and U.S. track and field. Well, if, if you go back through history, Jamaicans always had great sprinters. Herb McKinley and you know people, Don Corey and folks like that, Merlene Audi. So this wasn't like they came out of nowhere. Yes, um, it, it, it's a huge sport down there. You know the, the high school champs, boys and girls champs. You know the stadiums packed, so it's it's a cultural tradition. There's strong cultural support for it. Um, many many Jamaicans have left the island for American universities through sport, so it's a vehicle to move up in society. And so. And a lot of those athletes then have brought back knowledge and learnings from America. And now, you know, Jamaica has a lot of elite coaches, Stephen Francis and Glenn Mills. And at the various high schools, the, the level of coaching and expertise at the high schools right now is like miles ahead of where it was, say, 30, 40 years ago. I, I, I work with Victor Lopez. He developed the NACAC region coaching education program. So I've been in the Caribbean teaching coaches courses since the 80s, 1980s, and the level and the quality of, of coaching at the high school and youth level in Jamaica is huge to where it was 40 years ago. So the system's in place, it's building, the numbers are in place, you know, I see no reason why it can't continue. Now what's interesting, the women have kind of surged and the men have kind of fallen off which I find really interesting, where from 2008 through 2009, say through Moscow World Champs, it was kind of parallel. The men and women were just tearing it up in an equal number. Now the women are far exceeding the output of the men's program. I'm not sure why that is, but our sport runs in trends. It runs in cycles. But I see no reason why Jamaica won't be a major player on the world stage for, for years to come. The the level of coaching and the, the number of coaches at an elite level are just too high for it to fail. Now, mind you, they're fighting some incredible economic uh, hardships, and especially with COVID right now. I, I mentor a few coaches in Jamaica, and it's very, very difficult on the island right now. And do, do you agree, 
do, do you agree that these last uh, one to two years have been mentally the most challenging for track and field athletes because of the pandemic? Yeah, I would say undoubtedly challenging, you know, like, and, and it was very uh, diverse, like some countries had strict lockdowns. I mean, kids were training in their hallway or their back garden. Uh, you know, other countries, the elite athletes had access to a training center, but only so many days a week. A lot of athletes missed medical support because the medical support was just taken away. Um, I had five athletes that I had influence on in Tokyo, and I had a couple Paralympians in, in Tokyo, and all of those athletes were, were negatively affected in a huge way for various periods of time. And even on the ground in Tokyo, some of the holding camps had crazy regulations versus other teams that were pretty normal regulations. So you know, I won't name any names, but one athlete that I work with, his team had a, a very strict holding camp. They had to eat breakfast at 6 a.m. and train from 8 to 10 a.m. And that was it. That was the only time they were allowed out. So this guy was like almost in jail for 14 days during this holding camp. That can drive a person nuts. And how, I mean, you know, we, we know the, there are sports psychologists to, to help them out, but from your, from your lens, from your perspective, from a coach's perspective, how do you guide them mentally through, through all of this? Well, I think a lot of this has to do with coach athlete relationship and trust. So great coaches, master coaches are masterful at contingency plans, plan B, plan C. So like I had ice hockey players quarantine during the playoffs and to stay sharp, I had them playing on rollerblades with a ball in their driveway, dodging their kids and their dog, you know, to stay somewhat uh, fit. So that's an example of contingency programming. We, we had kids that couldn't get to the weight room. So I had them outside doing isometrics against their car bumpers. You know, it's how you manage the contingency and the athlete's confidence in those contingencies. I think a mistake a lot of coaches and athletes made is they took this period and went back and tried to work on weaknesses or quote, building a base. And they got so far away from what they normally do that the train got derailed. So a lot of this is the competency, the, the expertise, the coach's ability to build good contingency plans, and then to have the athlete relieve strongly and trust those contingency plans that you're gonna be okay when things open back up. Okay, and you, what, how, you, you coached Antonio Brown as well? How did this happen? How did this come about? Uh, I had a brief consultation with Antonio. Uh, he was signed by the Raiders. And I work with a former Raider named Bill Romanowski. And Bill does a lot of uh, consulting for the Raiders at the time. And um, Antonio had some injuries. And that's one of my... Uh, portfolios that I do is a lot of return to play and return to sport and rehab. And he asked me to come out and kind of put Antonio through some screens to see what was going on and suggest therapists to deal with what was going on. So it started out kind of as an injury thing. And then that led into working on some speed and his mechanics and his change in direction skills. So it was a short-lived project. It was probably three or four months, but originally it was designed to like take care of some injury patterns that he had. Are there, Amer are there American football players, coach, you think who can compete in track? Oh yeah, without a doubt. Same thing in NBA basketball. But, you know, if he's, you give some of these guys a year or two with a, a really knowledgeable coach and, you know, I, they, they would be knocking on the door. Do you encourage your athletes to cross train into other sports? Is this, is this something you recommend or encourage? It depends on stage of their career. Um, you know, I, I personally feel for youngsters and middle schoolers and 
and young high schoolers, the, the more sports you can do, the better. It, it slows down burnout and overuse and overtraining and, and, and what have you. And, and when you start to specialize, even then, I like to keep the door open. So, you know, in university, I seldom had a specialist. I coached universities for 30 years. And I would, I would encourage my long jumpers to also triple jump and maybe run on the relay. And, and uh, you know, my hammer throwers also through the disc and my shot putters always through the, the disc and sometimes played around with the hammers because I just feel you learn certain things from other disciplines that sometimes you can pull in to your main discipline and speed up the learning curve. I'm sure you've seen on social media the back and forth between Usain Bolt and football player DK Metcalf. How do you see this? Who do you think will win? And and I'm, I'm amazed at, at, at athletes, professional athletes who are huge, yet who run like a, who run like a gazelle. Well, I don't know if you followed it this summer, but uh, DK actually ran a couple of the, uh, the local regional track meets, and he, he shocked the track and field world in the States. I think, if I remember right, he ran in the 1020s or something like that. And, um, and that was with just a few months of kind of focused training on that. Yeah. So if, if, if he had a long stretch of training, you know, could I see him running 10-0? Absolutely. Now, Usain detrained several years. How much training would he need to get back to 10-0? I doubt he could just go out and run 10-0 right now. So I think it would be an interesting race. But I think both guys would be influenced by how serious they train and how long they have to train before said race. And what, you know, for, for, for parents out there, at what age do you recommend parents to have their little boys and little girls get into basic running you know, if they see their kids are really interested at what age do you think should parents get their kids into running well i think kids should run you know the minute they can walk <laughs> and, and i think most kids do some form of free running you know once they get pretty stable at walking Putting them into a design program, that's another question, you know, is does the, the youngster have interest, you know, or, or are they curious, are their friends doing it, you know, what's the expertise of the coach, you know, I've a couple track clubs in the area that they have a six through eight year old group. And it's pretty general and it's a lot of fun and games and whatnot, but, you know, they talk about running form and posture. And so these kids are getting a good foundation on what it is. And let's be honest, running's the, the foundation of so many sports, whether it be cricket or rugby yeah. or AFL football or football or baseball or what have you, if you can't run, you're probably going to be limited in those sports. So, you know, I think it's wise to me, running is a physical literacy foundational item. And, you know, like most foundational items, you know, if you start early enough with good instruction, responsible instruction, um, you know, I think it moves people ahead of the game a bit. What type of program do you create for your athletes who, who are stuck at home and who can't train outside during this pandemic? So what I do is I've, I've always presented the idea that your plan B should be plan A. It's just creative. So whatever we would normally do, I've got to go through every menu item and say, okay, how can we do this in our current environment? So, you know, some of my guys, if we had an acceleration workout, and we had 10s, 20s, and 30s out of the blocks. Well, we can't do that in the back garden or in the front street, but we can still do those runs in training flats or maybe up a hill in our back garden or maybe pushing our kid on a bike, you know, for resistance. We can do something very similar. And then the next menu item might be some kind of plyometric training. Well, there's different types of plyometrics that you could do in your house, like a drop jump off the steps in your house, or you could do some easy bounds in, in your garden, 
or you could hop over lawn chairs, you know, to like imaginary hurdle hops. So it's just staying with plan A, just coming up in plan B with creative things. Say the weather was just horrendous. Is there a bike workout, a stationary bike workout that we can do that would replicate that running workout? So for me, contingency planning is not coming up with a totally different plan. It's like taking your original plan that you'd hope to use and finding creative ways to do every menu item to keep the continuity going of that plan. Too many people just totally changed the plan, went too general or too much volume or whatnot. And they got so far away from what they normally do that it took them months to get back into the system. And I think that's why so many people struggled uh, to make the Olympics or, or do well at the Olympics. They, their plan Bs were so far away from plan A that they just never reconnected. How do you see track and field evolve, coach, from here on out? Do you, do you see more records being broken in 2024 in Paris? Because as we know, shoe technology also evolves. Yeah, I, I would say if world athletics doesn't step in, I think it's a, a nuclear arms race on these shoe designs. Um, but that said, I mean, there's only so much you can do with carbon plates and carbon rods and honeycomb designs and, you know, memory cells or, or whatnot. You know, there's a ceiling to how much you can do that. Um, a ceiling A in it could get so crazy with the return that the athletes just can't handle it or control it. But B, you know, it, it's a costing effect. Like, you know, it costs a lot of money to make prototypes and, and do beta testing and then change your factory to produce these things. And that's why shoe companies usually ran models that lasted three or four years because they, it costs a lot to reorganize that factory to make a new model. So there's a lot of economics behind this too, but um, I don't see them putting the genie back in the bottle right now. I'm curious, coach, what, how did Donovan Bailey perform after his injury? We got him back under 10 seconds. I think he ran 998. And uh, his injury was a complete Achilles rupture. And as the Achilles ruptured, it rolled up and it actually split. So there were several surgeries there. It was very complex. And uh, the first few surgeons he saw refused to do the surgery because they didn't want the responsibility of Donovan not running well again. And so we finally found a surgeon that would take the risk. And it, it was a very complex uh, um, project to get him back. And he was actually one of the first guys to start using different kinds of plates like we're seeing now because he had lost foot control during the injury. So some major nerves were damaged and he was not able to control his foot. So uh, Adidas, his sponsor at the time, experimented and built different shoes that allowed that foot movement to come back to normal. So at the time in the 90s, nobody was coming back from an Achilles rupture. You know, it's more common now because people have figured out how to do the surgery and how to rehab back and whatnot. When we were doing it, there was zero in the literature. It was kind of like, hey, you rupture your Achilles, you're done. So we kind of had to invent the process along the way. So, you know, kudos to the team that was around him, you know, to get him back under 10 seconds. Uh, in that era was, was pretty amazing. Are there, do you follow any of uh, present, any of the present track coaches? Um, do you see, do you see any of the young track coaches now? And you look at them and you, and you say to yourself, they remind me so much of you when you were starting out. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I was always raised to give back and pay it forward. You know, Coach Telez was kind enough to take me under his wing. So I probably mentor 50 or 60 coaches directly around the world, probably another 200 indirectly, periodically. Um, and so you, you always see traits or behaviors. You go, I used to be like that. And sometimes you got to warn them, say, hey, 
that's a valuable trait to have, but it's got a shelf life or it may come back to bite you in the butt. So be careful with that trait. Like I've made way more mistakes than successes as a coach. You know, I think you learn from failure and failure is not a negative thing for me. It's just, it's a springboard to find a new solution. But it, you know, the, if you're not comfortable with failure and you know how to correct yourself from failure, then I think you don't have a very long life in this coaching game. I'm sure you've established friendships and relationships with, with uh, athletes you've coached before. Have they, do they call you, text you, message you, asking for your advice on certain things? Yeah, I mean, I tell kids when, after they ask to, to come and, and be a part of our group or whatnot, I tell them after the vetting process and everybody's voted, hey, you're in the group, I'm like, I'm your coach for life until you fire me. Because I coach not only sport, but I coach life and life management. And yeah, I just, I, I got a long letter from a, a, an emergency room uh, doc in London who's battling, you know, COVID epidemic in London. And she's, the, the note was, I can't thank you enough for the mental resilience skills you forced me to learn and, and to enact and you held me accountable because I use them every day here now and it's saving lives. You get an email like that and it, it really touches you. Okay, coach, last, um, last question. It, I know it's getting late. It's almost 10 in the evening over in Texas. Um, my last question is what, I mean, how do you see coaching in, in track? How do you see it evolving a few years from now? Well, I'm a little bit concerned and, you know, that's why we work so hard. I, one of the groups I work with is the Altus group and, you know, in coaching education and mentorships and all of that. I think young coaches are swimming in knowledge right now. They have all these certificates and these letters behind their name and degrees and whatnot. So they're swimming in knowledge, but they don't know how to apply it or to how to solve problems or play the game of chess with all that knowledge. And they're swimming in so much knowledge that they struggle to identify these anchor points or these first principles. So I'm a little bit concerned with this generation of being too reactive to the internet or current research or you know, not seeing the big picture, so to speak, of getting biased or myopics on certain topics, trends, or patterns. So I'm cautiously optimistic, but I think where we need to do a lot of work is in mentorship and leadership and human dynamics and, and, and how to sift through all this information and pull out what's really important and rank those essentials in, in a productive way. All right, Coach, before, before I have you say your final words to our viewers, if um, a photo, if we can have a photo, which I will send to you after we, after our conversation is over. All right, on three, one, two, three. All right, coach, your final words to our viewers. Stay curious, build a broad, diverse input of information and keep faith. On that note, Coach, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor, an absolute honor to have you on the, on the show, on the program. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, please stay safe. All right, you too. And say hello to your father for me. I will. I will, Coach. All right, thank, thank you. you. Bye. And that ends another episode of Sports for All. It was an honor to have a conversation with Coach Dan Pfaff, one of the coaching le legends in world athletics. So until next weekend, so long everybody and stay safe.